We're going to talk about parenting today. Uh, so let me just say this right up front. I'm no expert. No expert. I have not arrived in this. And uh, some of you may be thinking, you know, what do you have to say that can help me anyway? I mean, what do you know? And, and so I, I will just admit to you, there are times as a dad, I know nothing. I'm just honest. There, there's a situation, something happens. I'm like, there's no instruction manual for this. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. But then there are other times where I, I kind of think, you know what? I don't think Jesus could have done a better job. <laughs> I'm like, I nailed that. That was awesome. And, and so we all go through those, those periods uh, of time. And, you know, I understand doing a series like this, we're also in different seasons of life. Some of us have young ones. Some of us have college kids. Some of us have adult children that are out of the home, have their own families. Some of us are, are, are just starting off in life, and that's something that we aspire to. But really what this series is about is leadership. How many of you would agree that parenting is really all about leadership? And in case you're wondering, leadership is about influence. That's simply what leadership is. And so every one of us today, no matter what season of life you're in, you have influence. And the heart of this series is that God wants us to impact the people that are closest to us. He wants us to influence people. Now, having said that, though, how many of you would agree that parenting it requires a plan? You've got to have a plan. It's hard to parent when you wing it. Let, let me say it to you this way. It's hard to parent when you're just reacting to situations instead of leading your kids and your family to a better outcome. Would you agree with that? That when we just react to things and we don't have a plan and we're just winging it, there's oftentimes we feel like we fail as, as parents. And we feel like we fail as leaders. Because, again, it's about influence. So part of having a plan is understanding this, that life consists of paths. And so as I started thinking about paths, I started thinking about, there's a famous poem out there that kind of talks about that, written by Robert Frost. And some of you can think of this poem already. It's called The Road Less Taken. And I just want to share it with you real quick. It says this, Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry, I cannot travel both, and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that passing there, had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh. I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. And I think without realizing it, I think what Robert Frost was talking about is a wise person and a foolish person. How many of you know a foolish person makes their own way? They blaze their own trail. They, they do whatever they want to do. They do what they think is best. But on the other hand, a wise person will walk the path that God has laid out. A wise person will walk the path that God has established. And Solomon talks about this in Proverbs chapter 22. Look what he writes. He says, direct your children onto the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. And I think in a roundabout way, what, what Solomon is talking about in that verse, I think he's talking about success. Because if we're honest today, our number one desire as parents, grandparents, maybe even uncles and aunts, is we want our children to be successful. Don't we? We, we want our kids to be successful. We, we want them to achieve things. Now, here's the problem with success, though, is that people have different ideas as to what success is. Have you ever noticed that? In a lot of ways, success is a moving target because there are some people out there that will tell you that success is all about happiness. If you're just happy in life, then you're successful. 
There are other people that will tell you that success is all about relationships. So if you're on LinkedIn, then you can be successful. Because it's all about connections and it's all about who you know. There are other people who will tell you that success is about working hard. It's about setting goals and achieving goals. Other people will say success is just you, you want to make a difference in people's lives. And then let's be real. There are other people that just simply say success is you have a lot of money. You have a nice car and a big house. And when you get that, then you are successful. So, so we want our kids to be successful. We want them to be successful. But here's what I want us to realize today. Having our kids be successful, though, that's not a good goal. That's not a good goal. And I know it sounds surprising, but here's what I want you to understand. Success is, a, success is not a goal. It is a byproduct. Success is not a goal. It is a byproduct. Now, I like what Estee Lauder said. She said, I never dreamed about success. I just worked for it. And I think what she understood is that success is a result of a process. Come on, parents. Success is a result of a process. Think about this. Success is not a destination. It's a journey. And so you think about the people in your life or the people that you admire and look up to, those people that you think are successful. They got to where they are because they followed a process. And they made themselves available to the process. I mean, you think about people who are financially successful. Do you know what they do? They follow a process. They save more money than they spend. They're disciplined. They're generous. They are able to recognize opportunities and strike when the iron is hot. It's not necessarily just luck. It is a process. They put money in the stock market and they're patient. They don't just react when, when things look up in the air. Are you, are you hearing me, church? It's a process. You think about people who you admire in their marriages and you say they're successful. It's because they follow a process. Death do us part. How many of you know that's a process? I'm committed to this thing. It's not always roses. There are bumps along the way. But I'm going to be a part of this process. It's you put the other person first and you serve, right? It's that you learn how to have conversations that are even difficult and not argue. You learn how to handle conflict. How many of you know that's a process? Amen. You think about people that have successful physiques that are on the covers of magazines and everything else. Some of that is Photoshop, by the way. But let me just say, they follow a process, though. They follow sound diet and exercise principles. They didn't just roll out of bed with a six-pack. And guns like me, okay? It's a process. It, it is a process. And so here's the, here's the idea today. Our goal as parents is not for our kids to be successful. Our goal is to help our kids become the right person. Because here's the thing, if you help your child become the right person, then you are setting them up for success. Amen. You are setting them up to be an influencer and not to follow the mold and the pattern of this world. Because here's what you know by now. Who you are follows you. And you know, we say this a lot of times, but a lot of times, even in our relationships, we always think it's the other person, and it's the other person who, who has a problem. But really, wherever you go, there you are. Amen. And you take your stuff with you, whether that's good or whether that's bad. And our children are no different. If you set them up to be the right person, then they're going to take those qualities with them into life. And it will help them be successful. Understand this. And I know this flies in the face of our world today. But who you are is more important than what you do. Right. See, we, we give people a free pass because we think they're talented. And because they can achieve a lot of stuff. And to us, that's what's fascinating. No, who you are. Your character. Your reputation. That matters more than what you do. And then think about our world today again. 
And again, this is, this is, this is going to be positive. I just want to paint this picture. Our world today caters to kids. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But what has happened is our children has become the center of our universe and our home. And you think about this. We can give our kids the world. And people are doing that today, right? They're putting them in the best schools. They're making sure they're in the right activities and they're in the right sports. And they're giving them all the latest and greatest gadgets. And we can give our kids the world and yet lose them as people. Jesus said it this way, what good is it if you gain the whole world but you lose your soul? If we give our kids the world, are we really setting them up for success? Or should our goal be, I want my kid to impact their world. That wherever they go, Jesus goes with them and he goes, he works through them. That's success. That is success. And so what I want us to do today is look at the book of Proverbs. So if you would, open your Bibles to Proverbs. I want us to see what the Bible says about how can we help our kids become the right person. And again, Solomon wrote most of Proverbs. He's considered by, by many to be the wisest person who ever lived. And so part of Proverbs is him writing to his children and giving them instructions. And notice what he says. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 1. He says, My child, never forget the things I've taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you'll live many years. Your life will be satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will earn a good reputation. Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. How many of you think there's some wisdom there? How many of you would think that, that Solomon's talking about ways that you can become the right person? And, and I just want to point this out quickly. The right person trusts God with all their heart. Amen. Hear me today, church. Becoming the right person starts with God. You, you, you're not going to become the right person when God's put on a shelf and he is not a part of your life. You may be successful in the eyes of the world, but when it comes to what is really matter, you have nothing to stand on. Because here's what happens. And this came from our devotional, by the way. So if you're keeping up with your devotions and the book we gave you, this will sound familiar. But it says this, without God, our kids will have to fill the role of God in their own life. Talk about pressure. Talk about stress. Talk about feeling overwhelmed. Without God, we have to try to fill the role of God. And how many of you know we can't do it? We can't. And some of us, that's where we are. We're struggling in life. Not necessarily uh, visibly, maybe on the outside you seem successful. But on the inside, you just feel like you're struggling. There's something that's missing. There's something that's off. And it's because you're trying to fill the role of God in your life. You're looking to yourself or you're looking to other things instead of learning how to trust in God. Because here's the thing, as parents, we don't want our kids to try to live life on their own. Come on, you've got to help me preach today. You want your kid to live life on their own? So we need to teach them how to trust God. Because here it is, a wise person depends on God. A wise mom and dad, grandparent, aunt, uncle, they trust God. They depend on God. Here it is. As much as you want to, you can't be with your child 24-7. But guess who can? God. 
And we need to teach our kids how to trust in God. Now, I'm not talking about blind faith today. I'm not talking about just jump in and have no, no thoughts or anything. I'm not talking about blind faith. But what I want us to do as parents, and I think what God's heart is for us as parents, is to teach our children that no matter what they face in life, that no matter what they battle in life, that God is able. Amen. That God is greater, that God is bigger, and that God is stronger. I want my daughter to know that. Amen. I can trust God. No matter what I'm in, he is able. He can lead me through. He can help me. And think about this. Trust develops confidence. You want your kid to walk through life with their head held high? You want your child to know who they are and who they belong to? Then you teach them how to trust God. Because trusting God develops confidence. Think about this. Trust is about obedience, right? Obedience is understanding that there's a right way to live and a wrong way to live. And again, that flies in the face of our culture today when we're told you can do whatever you want to do. Just don't hurt anybody. It, it's all okay. It's all acceptable. But if we want to teach our children to trust God, we have to teach them that there is a such thing as right and there is a such thing as wrong. There is a such thing as truth and there is another thing that's called lies or falsehood. And we need to teach our children how to obey God. How to look to his word for guidance and for instructions. Because I want you to think about this. Without God, our kids have nothing to stand on. Again, you can give them everything. But without God, our kids' lives are being built on the sand. And so when storms come in life, because as an adult and somebody that has experience, you know this by now, storms happen. If we don't give our kids God, if we don't teach them how to build their life on a solid foundation, instead of enduring and lasting through the storm, they're going to sink. They're going to sink. And so we need to teach our kids to obey God. How about this, parents? We also need to tr teach our kids that trust is about patience. Trust is about patience. And, and I know we don't like to hear this, but let me just say to you anyway, because I love you. There's nothing wrong with waiting. Right. I'll preach back here because I know that's not popular. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with waiting. Because I want you to understand part of the devil's strategy. He's sly. You remember a couple weeks ago we said that the devil schemes? You know part of his scheme? is to counterfeit things. Part of his strategy is to say, how about you take hold of what is good so that you forfeit what's best? I like what John Maxwell said. He said this, learn to say no to the good so you can say yes to the best. How about, how about we teach our kids that? That sometimes you got to work for something. Sometimes it's not just given to you. Sometimes you're just not entitled. You have to practice what is called patience. Sometimes you have to say no to what's good so you can take hold of what's best. See, the right person trusts God with all their heart. And then you know what else a right person does? A right person seeks God. That's what Solomon says. How many of you would say, I want my kid to know God, love God, and follow God? That, that's seeking we need to teach our kids how to do this because he, he, here's part of my, my fear as a pastor is that we're not giving our kids a solid foundation and we expect them to ride our coattails into heaven. Oh, come on, church. I, I don't want my daughter to ride my coattails. I want her to have her own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I want her life to be grounded and built on the solid rock, the foundation, Jesus. I don't want her to have necessarily my faith. I want her to have her own faith in God. Right? Amen. To seek God and to know God and to follow God and to love God. So here, here it is, just quickly. How do we seek God? And it sounds simple, but think of it this way. Seeking is seeing 
Seeking is seeing. Here's what I mean. We, we want to teach our kids to see what God thinks. How, how many of you would, would agree with me that, it would, that life would be a lot better instead of just moving forward that you paused and stopped and said, you know what, before I make any decision, before I even take the next step, I want to know what God thinks. What, what does God think about maybe this idea that I have? What does God think maybe about this emotion that I have? What does God think about this desire that I have? I want to see what God thinks. That's seeking God. How many of you know seeking God is seeing what God is doing? God's working in your life. Do you believe that? But I want you to understand he's working all around us. He's working in our community, in our country, but he's also working around the world. And sometimes we don't see it. We don't recognize it. I, I, I think as parents, our goal should be we want our children to look to God no matter where they are. No matter what situation they find themselves in. No matter where they go, that their eyes are open and they're aware of God and they're aware of his presence. I, I want to see what God is doing. And then seeking is also this. I want to see how God feels. Sometimes we miss this fact, but God does have emotions. And do you really want to know what sin is? Sin is, we, we get all these definitions of sin and it really is missing the mark. But do you know what sin does? It hurts God. It, it hurts his heart. It, it breaks his heart. And so again, before we make any decision, before we decide to do anything on our own, we say, God, how would you feel about this? And if it's going to hurt your heart, I'm not going to do it. I I'm not going to proceed because I want to be wise and I want to seek you. The, the right person seeks God and trusts God. And then you know what our last thing Solomon says? The right person does this. They fear God. They fear God. Now, we're not talking about being afraid or being scared of God. And so I, I'm going to put these on the screen because I want us to get this concept because sometimes when we hear that word fear, we, we can't work past it. We, we don't quite understand what it means, what that's referring to. But here's what fearing God is. Fearing God's about this. It's about respect and reverence. We should teach our children to respect God. To respect the things of God. To revere God. To revere his name. Do you know what that simply means? That we should live our life with a sense of awe and wonder and fascination as to how great God really is. That when we get out of bed in the morning, we're just in awe of who God is. And everything that he's done for us. That's what fearing God is. It's about honoring God. That before we honor anybody else, we honor God. And that's our heart's desire. That, that fearing God is, is about worship. And it's not just about singing songs. It's about living a life of worship. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Live a life of worship. And can I just say this? We should live a life of passionate worship. Amen. I just want to throw this out there to you for you to consider and for you to think about because I know what today is. Some of you are thinking, what's pastor going to say today? Because it's the start of football. What's he going to say? Because I see all your jerseys and stuff. Here's all I'm going to say. This is not the real game, by the way. But there is a game at 7 something tonight. The real game's at like 1. We play the Cleveland Browns. Okay? I love you. But I'm going somewhere with this. I want you to think about it. Church... And worship should be like what you're going to see tonight at 7 o'clock at Lambeau Field. 
That's worship. I'm telling you, that is worship. Worship is about being loud. It's about lifting your voice up to God. It's about clapping. It's about shouting. It's about jumping. It's about dancing. It's not about coming to church and like, I hope nobody hears me. It's got to be quiet in here. See, that's not worship. Do you know instruments and everything else that God created that? Some of us don't like it, but God created the drums. He said, when you worship me, bang the drums, baby. And you're going to hear that tonight. I don't want to work. I just want to bang on the drum all day. See, I know. I, I'm with you. I know. But I just want you to get this. When you watch the game tonight, that's worship. And so when we gather together next Sunday, we're going to bring it, baby. Because God's worthy of our praise. Amen. We're going to live that life of worship. We're going to live that life of worship. That's, that's fearing God. It really is. Not being timid. I'm going to express my gratitude and thanks to him. Understand what this is also. We're going. We're moving. But fearing God is understanding that God's good. Come on, church. We've got to get that in our heart. God's not mad at us all the time. He doesn't want to strike you down. He's not waiting for when you mess up. God is good. He's a good, good father. He gives good gifts. And fearing God is just knowing, God, you're good. I'm not going to run from you. I'm going to run to you because you're a good God. You're a good father. Right? Fearing God is this. It's recognizing that there are consequences for disobedience. Again, this is a spiritual principle. And as much as we try to get away from it, you can't. What you, what you sow, you reap. You reap what you sow. There, there are consequences. We need to teach our kids that. Sometimes parents, I'm just giving you something that I've learned. Instead of coming in right away and rescuing your kids, let them squirm a little bit. Let them learn that there are consequences to their decisions and their behavior. You're teaching them to become the right person. Fearing God is this. It's about running from evil. It's about listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Fearing God is, is this. It's resting in God's love. And again, this kind of goes along with God, God's goodness, but God loves you. God loves you. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. He loves us. He's not the angry grandpa. But he loves us. He wants us to come to him. And then here's the other thing. Fearing God is about receiving forgiveness. And again, this is where it gets hard on a personal level. Because sometimes when we sin and we know we've blatantly messed up, instead of running to God, we try to hide. We try to cover it up. We, we try to pretend like everything's okay, but we know it's not. And understand, again, God's heart Fearing God is, Lord, I know I hurt your heart. I know I sin, but I'm going to run to you because I know you want to forgive me. I, I know you want to pick me up. I, I know you want to set me on that path again that we've talked about. So I come to you, warts and all, knowing that you know everything about me anyway. So I'm not really fooling you at all. I come to you. That's fearing God. And then you want to know what fearing God is? Lastly, it's about becoming more like Jesus. That's what fearing God is. And I say this with all sincerity today and all honesty. I don't want Lila to grow up to be like me. I want her to grow up to be like Jesus. That's what our desire is as parents. That we want her to trust God, to seek God, and to fear God. And so I know the question that's looming here today because I feel it with you. The question is, well, how? That sounds great. But how do I help my kid become the right person? Here it is. First thing is this. Love Jesus. If you want your child to follow Jesus every day of their life, then mom, dad, grandparent, aunt, uncle, then you have to love Jesus. 
This is so important. If you want your children to trust God, then you have to trust him. And you have to show them what that trust looks like. You, you want your child to seek God, then you have to seek him. That before you make a decision, God, what do you think about this? That you, you recognize what God's doing and say, I want to be a part of that. That you think about how it makes God feel. You seek God. You, you want your child to fear God? Then you fear him. You fear him. You run to him. You rest in his love. You worship him. You follow him. And I know it's tough. But here it is. You have to lead the way. What does scripture say? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Loving God, following God, serving God. That's the priority of my life and my family. And sometimes mom, dad, they don't get a choice. It's we going to church. Because we're going to honor God. And we're going to worship God. You, should have stayed up, you shouldn't have stayed up till 2 in the morning. Oh, come on. Yeah, I know you're tired. We're going to church. Because we're going to love God. We're going to honor God. Is this helping? You, you have to do it. Because I was telling somebody this, and you may hear it again. But our kids will do in excess what we do. So if you want your kids to be radical, on fire for Jesus, you set the tone. You lead the way. You love Jesus. And then you want to know the last thing you do? How, how do you help your kids become the right person? You have to pray. Amen. You have to pray. Amen. Because here's what I want you to understand. This series that we're doing is not about being a perfect parent. Because I'm just going gonna, gonna to lay it out there for you. I failed. Even this week, I blew it. I'm not going to tell you what happened, but I messed up and I blew it and I'm not perfect. So this series is not about being perfect. What this series is reminding us of is that we have a Heavenly Father who is. Our God is perfect. you believe that today? And He wants to help you. Because sometimes as a parent, you don't know what to do. And let me just tell you, that's okay. And to some degree, I think that's the way God designed it. Because when you don't know what to do, you need to pray. And you need to ask God for wisdom. And you need to say, I don't know what to do. But your word says, if you lack wisdom, I can ask you for it and you'll give it to me. How many of you think that's good? Sometimes as a parent, you just need understanding. Sometimes as a parent, you just need to look at your child or what they're going through through fresh eyes. Sometimes as, as a parent, you just need peace. Because you're not sure in your natural mind how it's going to work out. But God, I need peace. Give it to me. I need some joy right now. How many of you know that comes by praying, from, from connecting with God? And then the most important thing is this. Prayer changes you. Again, in our devotional... This may sound familiar. Richard Frost Foster said this, to pray is to change. To pray is to change. So the opposite is true. If you're not praying, you're not growing. You're not changing. Because here's what you see, and I see this every day as a dad, and Lisa sees this. We talk about this from time to time. What I see in my child is me. And I'm telling you, it's not necessarily the good things that I do. I see me and her. And I'm like, dear God, please help me. Please change me. Because I want to set her up for success. And in order for that to happen, God, you got to help me. Pray. It changes us. But then here's the second thing. And this is so important. And, and I think to some degree this is, this is lacking. And again, as parents, we, we need to lead the way. We have to pray for our kids. Now here's what I mean. I know that you pray for them in your prayer closet. While they're getting ready to go to school, you may pray in the car. Whatever. But here's what your kids need. Please hear me. And again, this is awkward for us sometimes. 
But we got to push through the awkwardness if we want them to become the right person. You have to lay your hands on your child and they have to hear you call their name before God and pray blessing over them and pray favor over them. One of the scriptures I pray all the time over Lila is I pray this prayer that they said about Jesus. I said, Lila, I want you to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and everyone around you. We need to pray for our kids and lay our hands on them. And they need to hear you, mom and dad, call out to God. And so here's what we've done. In your bulletin today, there's a 30-day prayer challenge. Because sometimes if you're like me, you're like, okay, I get it. I need to pray. But how, how do I specifically pray for my child, for my family? So we have given you a 30-day prayer challenge. There are scriptures in there. And then there are sample prayers of how you begin to pray God's word over their life. And so here, here's all I'm asking you to do. Will you join me in this 30-day prayer challenge? That if we really believe prayer works and prayer changes things, and if prayer can change the tra tra trajectory of our life and our family, then we need to do it. Whether we feel awkward or not. So I'm going to invite you to do that. We're going to have daily reminders on Facebook, by the way, with the day and the prayer and the scripture that's coming up. So if you like the visual thing. But we're just asking you, commit to this. Because God will honor it. Because success is not the goal, it's a byproduct. We want our kids to be the right person. The right people. So we've got to set the tone. We've got to lead the way.